Thanks very much for staying with us. Time now for Eye on Africa with me, Georgia Calvin-Smith. Tonight, Senegal's youngest ever president takes the reins, vowing to usher in systemic change. 44-year-old Basser Diamai Fai represents a new, younger generation of politicians. Also, time should be no barrier to justice, as Rwanda gears up to mark the painful 30 years since the genocide in which eight 100,000 were killed. Rights campaigners call for no let-up in the international pursuit of the orchestrators of the slaughter. And although gender does not officially affect land rights in Senegal, in practice, many rural women farmers struggle to secure access in traditional communities that often sideline them from ownership. We take a closer look. And we do start in Senegal, where a new president has been sworn in, promising to shake up the country socially, politically and economically. Basar Odiyemai Fai's victory in last month's election reflects the hopes of many of his supporters to see more egalitarian impact of the country's prosperity. He's vowed to do what he can to work in Senegal's interests and those of the continent. I am aware that the results from the polls express a strong desire for systemic change. The Senegalese people are engaged in the construction of a fair Senegal, a prosperous Senegal, in an Africa that's progressing. And in the process of constructing this new Senegal, I will work tirelessly to preserve the peace and towards national cohesion. Well, Fai's run-up to his inauguration on Tuesday was a turbulent one. Just 10 days before the election, he'd been in jail. His fans are now excited about the prospect of a new era for the country. Our team reports. The ceremony was highly anticipated. Eight heads of state were on the guest list alongside a host of other dignitaries. Supporters of Pasiho Jomaifai's party, PASTEF, also came to see him sworn in as Senegal's new president. Many have faced prison in recent months. We had hit rock bottom in this country. Today the feeling of joy is driving us, a feeling of pride, because with the arrests there was resistance to oppression. I'm so happy because we fought a lot for a project, and it's this project which must save Senegal. Today we're at the pinnacle, with President Basirou Diomaye at its head. The French rapper Youssoufa also attended. He is one of Diomaye Faye's favorite artists. Generations change and tastes evolve. I take it as an honor. Beyond that, I think he will need more than my songs to accomplish the tasks before him. In front of the presidential palace, a large crowd gathered to applaud Senegal's fifth president. The feeling I have at the moment is one of joy and pride. We have invested lots of hopes in him. We think that he will restore democracy, that he will restore our institution. BDF, the initials of the new president, are now flying high on a flag above the palace. The Senegalese people are eagerly waiting to see how he addresses the country's major challenges, notably unemployment, and inflation. And the Democratic Republic of Congo's new prime minister has promised to prioritize peace and development in her first public speech since her appointment by President Felix Tshisekedi. Former planning minister Judith, Judith Suminwa Tuluka became the first Congolese woman to hold the post when she took office on Monday. The race is on to now form a new government as the country, country grapples with deepening clashes between soldiers and Rwandan-backed rebels in the East. Emmett Livingston tells us more. Congratulations have poured in across Congo for the country's first female prime minister, Judith Suminwa. The politician, who is a close ally of President Felix Tshisekedi, was appointed to lead the government on Monday night. Women's organisations and members of Congolese civil society have hailed Suminwa's appointment, with some also congratulating President Tshisekedi for what they termed his positive masculinity. Politics in Congo has traditionally been dominated by men, and many view Suminwa's appointment as a sign of progress. But the new prime minister hasn't just been chosen because of her gender.
It's a technocratic calculation that from the outset allows you to have someone who gets involved in the issues. There is enormous public expectation. The concerns are economic, jobs, diversification of the economy, purchasing power, security too, so you have someone who has an economic profile. This isn't someone who thinks of themselves as a successor, so they can already start proactive policy making. You have someone who will work for the president because they're a technician without personal ambition. Judith Thuminwa has economic expertise. Under the previous government, she was the Minister of Planning, which involves economic and social development. In her new job, she will be under pressure to revive an ailing economy. But for now, she has the delicate task of forming a new government and will have to decide between choosing technocrats like herself or bigwigs from powerful political factions. Emmett Livingston there for us in Kinshasa. Now, on Sunday, Rwanda will be marking the 30 years since Hutu extremists' devastating massacre of hundreds of thousands of Tutsis and those who supported them. Ahead of this painful anniversary, Human Rights Watch has called for no let-up in the pursuit of the remaining leaders of the genocide who may have fled abroad. At least two are still on the run. Clément de Roma tells us more. Human Rights Watch uh, archives published this week show that as early as 1991, the NGO had been sounding the alarm about uh, the potential for ethnically motivated, devastating violence in Rwanda. Three years later, around 800,000 people were slaughtered over 100 days in the genocide against the Tutsis. The public couldn't access most of these documents in the past. They include reports on the planification of the killings and on the massacres themselves. Also damning our letters to the UN and Western leaders who refused to use their influence to immediately stop the genocide when it began on April 7th, 1994. Human Rights Watch urged the United Nations to keep their peacekeepers on the ground, but the Security Council I decided to withdraw them, thus abandoning over 20,000 Rwandans to the slaughter of Hutu militias. Archives are still very important uh, here in Rwanda, especially in the run-up to the 30-year commemoration of this dark national chapter. Local associations are also collecting, sorting and digitizing thousands of documents in the hope of finding new clues indicating how the genocide was organized. Well, Clement touched on the importance of archives to Rwanda there. And the country is still piecing together its understanding of what created the circumstances that led to such a grim episode in its history. The granular details of who did what and who was lost are still being unpicked. But with time-dimming memories and eroding evidence, organisations supporting survivors are racing to digitise important documents. Our team tells us more. The survivors of the genocide against the Tutsis in Rwanda are sifting through thousands of files. Their organization is still looking for information about what led up to the massacres 30 years ago. There may be new testimonies, and there may also be information about the preparation of the genocide. We want to make these documents accessible, so that researchers who need them will have access to them. Just like other people who want to know what happened during the genocide, how it was prepared, how it was executed. After initial sorting, documents are digitally scanned and stored on dedicated computer servers. The group began updating storage of the archives in early 2022. All these papers we sort here will be digitized. Without numbering and digitizing them, the archive process isn't complete. Today, the preservation of documents related to the genocide is a national priority. Another NGO, Aegis Trust, focuses its efforts to safeguard history on collecting recorded accounts of what happened. This woman lost all of her children during the 1994 mass killings. I was asked to testify and I accepted because I'm sure that my story will help people heal from their traumas. It will help those who listen to me. This center offers support to women who lost their husbands in the genocide. Many have shared their stories. The accounts are later translated into English and posted online. Every year, the time left to collect these perspectives grows smaller. The elderly people are aging. They're starting to forget. So we mustn't miss this. We must use every possible means to record these testimonies while there's still time. As part of its commemorative efforts, Randa will introduce digital tours of the 170 memorial sites that are also the final resting places of many of the victims of the genocide. 
Well, although legally men and women should have equal land rights in Senegal, in practice, that's often not what happens. The inequality has made it particularly difficult for women farmers to assert their rights in communities, still relying on customs that can sideline them from ownership. Clarice Fortuné tells us more. Adding a bit of water, preparing compost is part of his training session in the town of Nyasia in the Casamans region. These female farmers, who traditionally have no access to education, are learning about their rights, how to finance their projects, and possibly influence future legislation. We have three objectives. The first is to promote the knowledge and know-how of the farmers who have long preserved food sovereignty in Africa. The second is to influence political decision-makers to improve agricultural governance. And the third objective is to promote products derived from agroecological practices or family farming. Maria Masonko is the president of a 115,000 strong rural women's rights movement in West Africa called We Are the Solution. As it's the case across Senegal and West Africa generally, women are not entitled to land ownership as it is expected when they marry, they will leave their community. On we can't follow every woman in her family's field, but we can bring them together here to build their capacity through practical demonstration sessions that will help them to better understand and improve their level of development. Today, Maria Masonko is trying to set up seven new training centres across southern Senegal. In one week, she and her team trained over 100 women from Senegal, Guinea-Bissau and Gambia in agroforestry, and micro gardening. Well, that's it for Iron Africa for now. Thanks for joining us, though, and uh, do so again if you can. Till then, take care.